My talk is about barley pangenomics and also pangenomics beyond barley in the genus Hordi well, <laughs> in the genus Hordium and there are um, two parts of my talk. The first one is about evolution and the second one about computation. So let me say what uh, what pangenomics has to do with evolution. So as you might know at, uh, at IPK we, we host a large gene bank. Um, I think the largest one in the European Union, and um, normally gene bank management is seen as a, as a tedious job of maintaining uh, thousands of plant genetic resources, um, but uh, um, Otto Franke, a geneticist at CSIRO, said that gene bank managers are actually crop evolutionists, uh, we are preserving the, uh, the seeds of the past for future crop improvement and uh, as such uh, a crop evolutionist has, has to think in hundreds of years and uh, generate the resources for uh, for future crop improvement. Um, actually what, what gene banks are and they can be actually considered as, as frozen diversity so uh, we, um, shall we consider these seeds as extant diversity or as past diversity um, that's not clear because this, is, this depends on how we use them, but they are certainly frozen because they are stored at minus 18 degrees. And uh, it's not obvious how these, uh, how these seeds uh, stored in a large, basically room-sized freezer can be put to good use. And uh, we, spent, uh, we thought hard about um, how we can make um, gene banks into or how we can make gene banks more useful, how we can facilitate access, and one of our um, key concepts is that we want to transform our gene bank and also gene banks around Europe and uh, internationally into biodigital resource centers. And um, to fill the digital part of biodigital, um, constructing genomic resources for uh, genetic resources is crucial. So in the, in the first step, we, uh, we genotyped our entire barley collection uh, with uh, genotyping by sequencing. And the next step is to do um, genomics or pangenomics on a small subset of it. And this will be um, the, main, the main topic of my talk. So uh, this is a, a map that shows the, the origin of uh, barley accessions uh, in our gene bank, at least those that uh, originate from the old world. Um, you can see that we have uh, about 4,000 accessions from Europe, that's where we host it and uh, where most of our material comes from. But uh, we have also decent representation of other parts of the world. Um, in 2019, we published uh, what we call a gene bank genomics study. Uh, this, uh, the key part of this study was genotyping our entire barley collection of 22,000 accessions uh, uh, was gen genotyping by sequencing, a marker technology that um, gives about 50,000 markers along the genome. And um, the first thing we did with our marker ma matrix was to run a principal component analysis um, to analyze the genetic structure. And the overall pattern that we found is that uh, uh, genetic structure correlates, correlates well with geography. We have three major germplasm groups uh, uh, Western barley, Eastern barley, and Ethiopian barley. And this is also consistent with other marker technologies. Now, this, this gene bank genomics gives us a, a good idea about uh, the distribution of diversity of barley around the world and what are the major germplasm groups. And this is a solid basis to perform pangenomics to select the most representative uh, accessions um, to do expensive genomics work and uh, yeah, make sure that uh, the accessions we choose for sequencing are the, the best possible. So to move from gene bank genomics to pangenomics, uh, the, the first step is to make the selection of germplasm that we want to analyze with genomic approaches, because um, genome sequencing has gotten cheaper, but it's still expensive. We cannot do it on the scale of all uh, collections, but maybe on the scale of tens of accessions. So the goal of pangenomics uh, is to construct a catalog, a catalog of structural variation. So uh, with past sequencing approaches, we, we, uh, we were able to focus on, on short insertion and deletions and SNPs. But uh, with, with the knowledge of entire genome sequences, we can look for stru larger structural variants, uh, also for chromosomal rearrangements, which I will show you uh, play an important role in biology genetics. 
and uh, to complement uh, a small number of high quality genome assemblies, uh, we, we also genotyped a larger diversity panel to um, to link the, the, the or to genotype the structure variant we found in the larger barley germ in, la uh, in the larger uh, panel of barley germplasm to look for allele frequencies of structure variants, and then based on these resources we can do many different approaches to link uh, uh, genetic variation to phenotypic variation, and also the next step will be to make this uh, this variation accessible via browsers. So to walk through this process, uh, let's start with, with the basis of pangenomics. So in the, in the first stage of the Bali pangenome project, uh, uh, we constructed chromosome scale sequence assemblies for 20 barleys. And chromosome sequence as scale assemblies means that these assemblies were as good as the MOREX reference genome that we published about five years ago. So we we selected the, the accessions to represent uh, the barley diversity space as best as possible. And the PCA that is shown here is different from the first one because here the uh, axes 3 and 4 are shown that uh, uh, largely uh, separate Europe into two road and six road barleys and Asia into barleys from East and Central Asia. And the, the, the colored dots are the accessions we, we chose and they, reasonably, they are reasonably well placed in the barley diversity space. And in addition to these uh, domesticated accessions, cultivars and land races, we also selected a single wild barley from Israel. So the, the first thing that we found uh, when we compared the, the genome assemblies, when we aligned them and made uh, these dot plots, is that uh, we have large inversions. Um, so this doesn't look so large, uh, because we look here at the scale of a whole chromosome of uh, more than 500 MB. But the, we see uh, uh, inverted sequences, so uh, uh, a section of the genome that is uh, changed in orientation, and these uh, sections can be um, uh, <coughs> megabases in size. And uh, we we did a survey of these uh, inversions and found that they are basically present in in uh, in each barley genome. So meaning that we compare uh, a sequence barley genome to the Morex reference, we are almost certain to find a, a large inversion of, of several megabases. And we we decided on to focus on on two of these inversions. Um, the first one is shown here, a chromosome two H, and. For this inversion, we looked up uh, where it actually occurs, and we found that it's limited to uh, northern European spring barleys. Um, we, we didn't find it in a single wild barley, so our hypothesis is that this inversion uh, arose after domestication, probably in European barleys. And interestingly, this inversion of chromosome 2H is close to an important flowering time gene in barley. Um, the uh, central radi radialis ortholog in Bali, so this is, uh, I think, also known as EPS2. So this is early per se flowering time gene that is uh, common in northern European spring barleys, and it's tempting to speculate that this uh, inversion close to the gene may have an influence on the uh, regulation of the gene and uh, uh, thus may impact the flowering time phenotype, although we have no hard functional data yet to prove this hypothesis. And the most striking inversion that we found is a, a 141 MB inversion on chromosome uh, 1H that we found in the uh, elite barley variety RGT planet. Uh, we uh, validated the presence of this inversion uh, also by help of genetic mapping. If we make uh, if we uh, make a genetic map from a uh, in the population. Uh, where the two parents differ for the presence of the inversion, we see a uh, repressed recombination uh, compared to a normal uh, mapping population that is isogenic for the absence of the inversion. Um, we tried to trace back um, the inversion. Where did it uh, originate? How did it come into RGT Planet? And we checked the pedigree of RGT Planet, and we could um, trace it back to a variety from the Czech Republic called Diamant or, or Diamond. And this uh, uh, diamond variety uh, is a, was created by mutagenesis of a, another Czech variety, Valtitsky. 
and strikingly, by, by PCR genotyping, we found that uh, the inversion is present in diamond, but absent from Baltitsky. So the, the most likely reason, uh, or the most likely way how the inversion arose is, is as a consequence of the mutagenesis, uh, which was done by radiation, and probably a double strand break uh, was uh, uh, repaired by uh, and uh, this created uh, an inversion and uh, this the 7H inversion has since risen to quite high frequency in uh, two old spring barleys around the world and for breeders uh, this is interesting because the the inversion limits recombination in a large region uh, in a large gene rich region on chromosome 7H so there's it creates basically a large haplotype block that, that cannot easily be broken so to to maybe uh, um, synthesize this, these results, uh, where well, you you know uh, probably this the schema of, of crop evolution that uh, diversity uh, reduces is reduced by domestication and then subsequent selection. But our result our results in structure variants uh, have shown that uh, um, humans were quite good in, in selecting a newly arisen variants like the uh, inversion on, on, on 2H. Um, they also maybe unintentionally created new structure variants on chromosome 7H and thereby enriched uh, the, the diversity of the, spe of the crop species. And uh, this is not only limited to barley, there are other important crops like wheat or tomato where uh, breeders also have pursued another way of enriching crop diversity, and this is by means of alien integrations. So this is something that in Bali has not really been used. Um, and this is uh, also uh, what I want to talk about next, and how pangenomics can maybe help to enrich the gene pool of Bali by alien integration. And uh, let me start with the gene pool concept of Jack Harlan, uh, uh, important uh, geneticist, also biogeneticist from the U.S., who came up with the idea of, uh, of gene pools to uh, to group the wild relatives of a species, uh, not according to their phylogenetic distance, but how easily they are crossable with the with the crop, and how easy it is to transfer genes from one species to another. Um, the primary gene pool of barley is Vadium spontaneum, um, wild barley that occurs um, throughout the Middle East. There's a single member of the secondary um, gene pool of barley, Hordium bulbosum. This is a species that can be crossed with barley with some difficulties and interrogation lines can be created. And then there are more than 30 species in the genus Hordium, so barley wild relatives that cannot be easily crossed with barley, but they look fairly similar to barley, and they may, they may have important genes that, when transferred into barley, may confer useful function or, or useful traits like biotic or abiotic stress resistance. And this, this, uh, this approach of using alien integrations has been uh, uh, used in other cereals, notably, notably wheat, but in, in barley, this, um, this is, uh, there's, uh, I think no report that the crop wild integration line had been uh, 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 had been employed in breeding. So um, to uh, um, yeah to to maybe make it easier to use uh, uh, plant genetic resources from wild relatives, uh, we follow two steps. The first one is we that we want to uh, improve the genomic representation of the uh, primary gene pool of barley of um, Hordium spontaneum and in the second phase of the barley pan genome project uh, which is currently ongoing we have selected about 20 wild barleys uh, from across the range of the species to um, generate uh, genomic resources uh, also to for example to clone resistance genes in wild barley but maybe also to study other traits. And in total, this uh, the second phase of the barley pan genome includes uh, close to 80 genotypes. Um, they, are select they were selected uh, also from the center of diversity of, of the species from the Near East and the Mediterranean, but also um, include uh, elite cultivars from around the world. And um, the second uh, 
uh, avenue to uh, facilitate the use of wild resources in Bali genetics and breeding is to create a, geno uh, a genus-wide pangenome, a hordium. So uh, we have formed an international panhordium consortium, um, several of whose members are also in the, in the audience. And our goal is uh, to assemble um, the genomes of all diploid barley-wide relatives and uh, several selected polyploids. Um, we want to construct genome sequences that are as good as the current Morix reference genome for barley and then do a genomic analysis to, uh, to understand what makes these sequences uh, or these species different from Bali and to also use these uh, reference sequences to identify genetic variation in the wild species that can be useful for Bali breeding. And if you want to learn more about the, the use of uh, genetic resources there uh, and how to assemble genomes, uh, the first opportunity will be to listen to the next talk by Aina Haraldsson and there are also posters by Helen Pidon about the cloning a resistance gene from Hordeum bulbosum and uh, a poster by my PhD student Jiang Wu Fang who uh, reports about the assembly of an uh, autotetraploid Hordeum bulbosum genome. So the second part of my talk will be about computation or maybe more about how we make, uh, how we make accessible uh, all the genomic resources we created or, or better even what are the challenges in doing so. So maybe probably even during the last biogenetics symposium Niels probably told you how difficult it is to assemble genomes uh, but since then we have had several what I want to call candy shop moments where we felt like uh, a child in a candy shop and we could eat as many candy as we want. And this basically means that genome sequencing has gotten very cheap and easy and we can do now many things uh, that we only uh, dreamt of five or ten years ago. So, ten years ago, um, sequencing assembling a single barley genome um, cost about one million euro or more and took ten years. And uh, with the progress in genome assembly methods, uh, we can now realistically think of uh, assembling tens of barley genomes in a single year and also extend genomic approaches to barley wild relatives uh, for which resources, re research resources are very limited. So um, with, uh, this has been a uh, very exciting time but uh, basically this is now the new normal. Genome sequencing has gotten very easy and um, the challenge is to find ways how to make sense of the genome sequences that we can so easily generate. And uh, a concept that um, uh, has been put forward and that has re uh, had, uh, had motivated great expectations is the graph-based pan genome. Uh, it's uh, basically a computational structure to, pr uh, to, present, uh, to represent a collection of genome sequences and there are several ways to Visualize a graph-based pan genome. One is these, uh, one of these, these nice-looking tube maps. But um, I think common to all the graph genome approaches is that they, uh, that there are challenges in scaling them to collections of maybe hundreds of genomes, and also to uh, um, to devise intuitive um, visualizations, and also to to find ways how to make a graph-based pan genome a, a tool for for genetics, and in the first, we, we came up with a, with a workaround to, in our Bali pangenome paper to make uh, use of pangenome graphs for association genetics. Um, um, as you may know, Bal the Bali genome is highly repetitive. 90% of the genome are composed of repeats that are highly similar to each other and that me just mess up graph construction. So to make things easier, we focus first on a single copy pangenome which um, basically contains all the genes in some um, uh, single copy sequence close by. So single copy means it, it, con it occurs only once in a single genome. And of course, it, uh, it's, it can be present in multiple genotypes. And from, from this uh, single copy region, we extract short representative sequences, KMERS, which you can think of as like PCR primers that are specific for a genomic region and can be scored uh, uh, easily in a large uh, collection of sequence reads. And from this we can derive a, a presence-absence matrix of, of KMERS in, in a um, uh, 
in sequence data of a large barley panel. And uh, this allowed us to do GWAS or genome wide association mapping uh, with our uh, um, pan genome derived uh, uh, K matrix. And uh, we, we took an easy example. To, to try out how well it works. This is the, uh, we did a GWAS for the naked grains trait, and uh, as expected, we came across a locus on 7H where the new gene is located that Shintaketa cloned about 15 years ago. And uh, we found a deletion in our pan genome that uh, just corresponds to the known, uh, known uh, new deletion. And this is all. Uh, known stuff. Uh, it's, it's a nice proof of principle. Maybe one, one useful thing uh, that we learned from, from, from our sequence data is that uh, so far we have no evidence that there is another uh, gene that controls a naked grain trait. Uh, all the naked barleys that we have in our panel, um, they, lack the, they lack the new gene and all the hard types have the new gene. So we have no support for for the presence of another gene controlling a naked grain trait. So with this, I want to sum up my talk. Um, um, we we see our research in the larger context of making Bali genetic diversity from germplasm collections accessible um, to breeding and genetics. And uh, we think that genomics is an important aspect of doing so. And uh, and we have uh, applied uh, several approaches, assembly resequencing and new methods like Kenergy was. And with the decreasing costs in, for genome assembly, we, we believe that maybe in, in five or ten years we can uh, think about uh, getting genome sequences for thousands of barleys. And uh, with this, I want to thank uh, my collaborators, most importantly Niels, with, with whom I'm collaborating on all aspects of barley genetics and genomics. Um, the work on the first Bali pan genome was led by Murakatik Jayakori, a postdoc in my group, and uh, Sudhasan Padmaras, who a postdoc in Niels' group. Um, the nice illustrations that I showed in my talk were drawn by a former PhD student in my group, Mona Schreiber. I thank all the partners in the International Bali Pan Genome Consortium, uh, in particular Klaus Mayer and Manuel Spannagel, with whom we collaborate on genome annotation, and Cheng Dao Li, who uh, did a great job in analyzing the 7-H inversion that uh, was central to our Bali pan genome study. And with this, I I'm, want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Jihad Urabi, Nordic Sea. Thank you, Martin. It was very nice talk. In your uh, first result about uh, the global diversity, we have seen that the Ethiopian barley was a unique, and I agree with that. I worked on the Eritrean barley, and it was the same. But in the pan genome, we did not see any representative from that gene pool. For the Ethiopian barley? Yes. Yeah, there was one. Uh, from, from the map, I did not see Ethiopia. Yeah, so this is this dot here. Because in this, in this new PCA, Ethiopia is just in the middle. OK. So we have, we have, we have one uh, Ethiopian barley in the first version of the Bali pan genome. And we selected uh, another for the second version. So we do, we do know that Ethiopian Bali is special, and we try to select it for our pan genome. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. This excellent presentation. <laughs> My question is a little bit of a static question, okay, because I'm really excited to see progress legs stage to the Hodium genius, that's the pan genomes. So I just wonder if have any idea once you finish the whole genius and the pan genome, you will get the information how we're able to break the barriers to between the different whole species to transfer the genetic variation from other genius to the whole vulgus. You mean to, to uh, overcome crossing barriers? Yeah. yeah. I think the genome sequences can help us understand why they are crossing barriers. If we can overcome them is another question. But it may be possible to, to map and clone resistance genes, for example, or other genes in a, in a wild species, and then transfer them with transgenic approaches to barley. So to, 
to identify useful genes and introduce them to the crop. Thank you, Martin, for the funny drawings. I wonder how did you do them, by hand squiddling or with the software? Well, as I said, they were done by my PhD student, Mona Schreiber, and I think she uses an iPad for drawing. <laughs> but she draws with her hand, yeah. Next question is Klaus Pill. Martin, thanks uh, for this excellent talk. Uh, I, I was missing uh, a little bit about uh, allele mining. Uh, could you mention or could you talk a little bit about your current concept of allele mining uh, in the gene bank of Gattersley? Yeah, so with allele mining, you mean to, to uh, you have a known gene and you want to know the, the sequence variation. Yeah, or our goal is that we want to develop resources that people can do this with the sequences we generated. And I mean, with the GBS, this is patchy sequencing and you need to be lucky to have your gene sequenced. But in, in the last couple of years, we have generated resequencing data for 1,000 barleys from our collection. And uh, we will publish the data in the coming years, or maybe in, within the next two years. And we also set up a, a browser called DiffBrowse uh, where you can look up a gene and see all the SNPs and indels that are on the gene. So that, that uh, layer mining is basically an in silico exercise that uh, people can do in our web interface. So Klaus Meyer from the Hemel Center in, in, in Munich. So all the questions come from the small group over, over here. Uh, strange. <laughs> We should do a PCA plot. Um, 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 I have two two questions. So, when talking about the the uh, pan genome, we are usually looking at the at the overlaps and dif differences among individual genomes, and we see individual genes or gene groups uh, ex expansions or inversions or wh whatever whatever in the individual genomes, which uh, which uh, which make a difference among genomes. We never look at the super genome, so the collection of all of the genes. Uh, all of the genes. Let's leave it by the by the genes or uh, regulatory uh, diversity, uh, and we don't manage to really compute the phenotypic consequences from the from the from the variations we observe. Second part of the question is: I was very much impressed by a paper which came out a couple couple of years ago on tomato, where they managed to uh, to reconstruct uh, the modern cultivated tomato by inserting, I think, seven domestication mutations in the in the wild type and shortcutting the the domestication history of six six thousand years or so into into three years. So I wonder whether these kind of paths uh, could be could be followed in in Bali as well or wh whether one could think vision vision uh, have, a, have a vision about building up a, a super genome which contains all of the uh, uh, variations by whatever means by whatever means uh, which contains all of the variations and what uh, what this would uh, look like and uh, to use this as a you know uh, as a as a basis to do to introduce new new variations. Okay, I'll leave it like that. Yeah, long question, short answer. <laughs> That's a grand version. Um, I think we can probably deliver the genomics part in the next five to ten years. Another challenge will be the technical aspect of transferring genes between species by gene editing. Probably Jochen Kumlein will tell more about this. Uh, we, we probably can redo, uh, mimic the tomato work. We know the key domestication genes of barley, and it's probably possible to, to modify them also in wild species to, to work towards domest de novo domestication. But I personally think the, the more valuable approach is to try to use the existing crop and modify it with genes from the wild species and try, and tr instead of trying to start completely new with de novo domestication. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's my good morning. It's my great pleasure to, for the first time, present my work on a gen new genomic resource for the Hordeum genus, a uh, reference genome of Hordeum rectifolium. Um, yeah, let's uh, start here. And as Martin has mentioned before, that we are quite restricted with our genomic resource pools for 
barley improvement or crop improvement because of hybridization barriers within the horbidone genus. So we have generally just within species and then bulbosum partially successful, but within the horbidone genus there's hybridization incompatibility. But within the horbidone genus we have 33 species and they're a great resource, potential resource for uh, biotic and abiotic stresses and also for potentially biofortification but also for life history, annual versus perennial life histories. And why do I talk about that? Because we believe that perennial cereals could be a solution for sustainable agriculture, as they invest a lot more in root growth and continual growth through seasons, and that will facilitate quite a few uh, great benefits as reduced soil erosion, improved water and nutrient efficiency, and a great benefit, uh, additional benefit is carbon sequestration, something we need to desperately these days. Um, and also reduced herbicide use as it will always cover the soil and no need to tilling or manual input every single harvest season or planting. But as said before, breeding of perennial crops is quite labor intensive and time consuming. Um, and with that, I would like to give you a quick introduction in uh, the Hordeum genus. As uh, you all know that barley is originating in the Mediterranean region, there in blue. And then we have quite a few an annual perennial species there. And then as they spread across the globe, we have three perennial species in uh, Eurasian, you can see there in the green, where they travel or on to North America and then travel down to uh, South America, where we have a rapid speciation event, where the rich richest species diversity within the Hordeum genus is. But also there we have a transition again to annual life history and also a perennial in a distant clade away from Hordeum vulgare, which Hordeum is there at the bottom next to a single perennial that is bulbosum. And why do we find that also a great resource for us is because within the Hordeum genus it would allow us to decipher uh, potentially the genetic co control of annual versus uh, perennial life histories in cereals. And that is also a benefit that uh, these are annual and perennial relatives of barley, so they will allow us to dissect this and hopefully find the genetic differences controlling longevity. But to, in order to do this, we first need a complete reference genome of these species. And for that, we want to focus on, in my group, on the first five, or the last five, so to say, uh, where we have this nice clade, distal clade of perennial, two perennial species and three annual species. Um, and for the first reference that I wanted to generate was I selected Hordeum rectifolium. And like just a brief introduction to rectifolium, it's uh, unique in a way that it's endemic to a single location in uh, South, yeah, South Ar um, Central Argentina. And it's found there, was collected there in uh, salt holophytic vegetation. And you can see it there on the right, it's quite unique and different from barley. So it's uh, quite robust and large species. Um, and then you can see on the map where we have the annual species distributed across the two continents into Cetans, Pusillum and Oclaston. And then the closest perennial species to Arctifolium is Stenostachys. And yeah, the arrows are kind of the distribution of those. And why did I choose Hordeum Arctifolium as my first one? Um, I find it quite interesting, a unique leaf morphology that uh, Hordeum rectifolium has. As you can see there on the left, it's the sort of fully turgid leaf. Uh, it's flipped around so the ridges are the underside of the leaf while the top layer is smooth. And it's quite unique as, as, it, as it loses water, uh, turgor, or uses, loses water, it curls up ne uh, nicely as you can see on the right picture where it curls up on both sides towards the midriff of the leaf. And as soon as it is watered again, it unfurls and retains its structure, so they never collapse, which was sometimes a bit difficult in the beginning because we thought it was not suffering water stress because the leaves were all wrecked and green and nice, um, but the plant was quite shrunk. And additionally, uh, in HHU, in Düsseldorf, a fellow PhD student of mine, Michael Anoche, is conducting a field experiment of the uh, of 26 additional Hordeum species. And if you have a chance, you'll have a poster at the poster session where you can ask him a lot more details on that phenotyping. And here I just wanted to show a quick comparison between Erectifolium and Morex, where we have first uh, dry shoot biomass. We have Morex in green and Erectifolium in 
orange, um, that they are quite at the opposite end of biomass production. So Hordermic Actifolium is fairly slow growing, which um, also um, and then catches up always over the years, generally, as it produces more biomass each year season. Uh, then we have the carbon-nitrogen uh, ratio, which is also an indicator of the carbon recycling in nitrogen, where Actifolium is investing a lot more in uh, carbon structures than Morex. And finally, for the potential water use efficiency, is uh, we have Delta C13, which is often an indicator of water use efficiency as stomatal conductance, so isotope discrimination of C12, C13, where Arctifolium is again at the opposite, it's more discriminating for C13, so it's potentially more water use efficient. And without further ado, let's get on to the results and or process. And first I want to give you really a rapid uh, overview of the assembly process of the base sequence. Um, bear with me. So first I extracted high molecular weight DNA of uh, my plant, sequenced, had it sequenced with uh, nanopore technologies uh, to obtain long reads, uh, especially to span these uh, repetitive sequences. Uh, first I sampled with fly and then due to the downside of nanopore having a quite a bit higher error rate. First I needed a couple of rounds with the long reads themselves, mapped the genome to polish out the first errors and then highly accurate Illumina reads to polish out the remaining tiny indels and SNPs. And then did incremental scaffolding with uh, complementary technologies, first uh, using 10x genomics and linked reads, then bio mapping, and finally high c and to get it to the final pseudochromosomal arrangements. And with that, now we have the first base, and in comparison always with uh, Morix, our reference for barley, uh, you can see the genome sizes are fairly different between Rectifolium and Morix, almost a gigabase difference whereas the assembly sizes are f more closely and uh, about 3.9 and 4.2 gigabases. I analyzed the repeats and again for more ex the same pipeline, EDTA, uh, genome annotator of transposable elements. Their Arctifolium is showing a little bit less repetitive ratio than uh, barley with 88% versus 84 and then respectively we have non-repetitive regions around 618 to 508 megabases respectively between Herectifolium and Morex. And then as a general metric of uh, gene space completeness, I used Busco and a specific POLIS database to compare it to Morex and there we get in both references 98%. Um, and with that we can have first look at the uh, genome as it in comparison to Morex. And here we can see quite a bit of structural rearrangement. So on blue, we have Horton Rectifolium, and below that, uh, the Morex version 3 reference genome. In orange are the inverted regions, and gray are the syntenic. We don't see a lot of translocation duplications, probably due to the scale of the chromosomes, that they disappear. And I would say within one chromosome of Rectifolium compared to Morex, we have more uh, inversions than the whole 20 pan barley genomes combined. Um, and most notably here you can see uh, on chromosome 3 there is a complete inver inversion of the chromosome. And to maybe alleviate questions, so these were the inversion sites were already spanned by bio nano mapping when we do the high C, so they should be correct there. But no genome is complete without. The genes. So for that, I sampled 12 different tissues at two different time points to get the greatest sort of spatial temporal resolution of the transcriptome. And each of the 22 samples was sequenced individually with PacBio isoseq. So I can tease apart from which tissue and time point the transcript is coming from. And um, so I sampled six vegetative tissues and then six reproductive tissues. And for that, I'll jump again into a big, really rapid overview of the process there. We did PacBio isoseq and, and then we used the library preparation that captures the fry prime cap of the transcript and also the poly A tail because then after, after the first processing I can filter out all transcripts that were not complete, so any degraded transcripts. And then there's no assembly required, so every transcript that I get is a true representative found in the plant and also allows us to look at the isoforms, specific isoforms of those transcripts. I mapped them to the genome, collapsed the redundant uh, transcripts, 
then use Codant for an open reading frames of these transcripts and to fill in the gaps, I used the de novo predictor of structural gene annotation Helixer. Then combine these two data sets together and do the first round of functional annotation with Mahman Mercator. Um, and here we wrap them up. Uh, so with IsoSeq alone, I'm getting 38,000, over 38,000 unique loci on the genome. Um, and there are over 28,000 uh, protein coating loci and over 140,000 potential isoforms thereof. Uh, around 10,000 are predicted as non-coding. So these are possibly, um, most likely, long non-coding RNA as they have the same structure as mRNA. So they would be captured with the same library and preparation. Um, and then we have the first look at the uh, uh, annotation. So in orange you see, uh, so uh, let's look at the table. So Mahma Mercator is a manually curated database of plant protein families containing over 5,000 unique plant families. So every single one that is in there has been manually curated. And there I could compare kind of the completeness of my genome and also get the annotation for those. So in the orange you have the annotated portion of the submitted sequences. And in the blue, we have uh, the occupied categories. So how many categories my data uh, annotated proteins are going into. And thereof, just with IsoSeq, I'm reaching 77%. So um, almost a complete profile of the transcriptome. And combined with uh, Helixer, we're getting up to 95% of the occupied categories on par with uh, Morex reference. And um, what is the genome, and then we have the transcriptome, but it wouldn't be of any use without trying to find out what these genes then do. And for that, we are in our group, we're doing interspecific crosses between these five annual and perennial uh, relatives um, that is being led now by uh, Elise Putz, another fellow PhD in my group. And if you have a chance, he'll be giving a flash and dash presentation tomorrow and give you much more detail on the process there. So here we can see on the left side, we have, yeah, left, yeah, uh, we have intercedences and the annual, um, the annual species. And on the right, we have Hortium erectifolium, uh, my perennial reference. And in the center, we have the F1 hybrid. So it's having features of both parents, but it's showing quite a hybrid vigor as it's producing way more tillers and also more biomass. And it will be quite exciting to see how that will go in the future. And with uh, that, I would like to quickly summarize up my talk. So here I've generated a high quality reference genome of a perennial species within a Hortium genus. So kind of at the opposite, complete opposite end as to barley. Um, and it will be a great genomic uh, resource for discovering novel genes to stress adaptation, life history differences, and also with a great data set of the IsoSeq that that provides us will facilitate a nice exploration. And as Martin mentioned before, uh, we're part of the Pan Hordem uh, collab international collaboration where there'll be over 24 additional Hordem species sequenced and created into a Pan Hordem database. And whereas we all sequence and assemble and focus then more onto these five in the distal clade. And in addition, generating interspecific F1 PCF1 and F2 populations for gene identification. And with that, I would really like to thank all the collaborators and everyone that participated in the project, especially Maria von Korf and everyone in my group, and also Hannah Simko and her group, which did the bio mapping for me, and also Martin Musher and Jia Wu Feng, which helped me with the high C and getting it to the final pseudochromal range and input on the genome. And if you found this talk quite interesting and would like to um, get more into it. We just are looking for a new postdoc. <laughs> we got a four-year postdoc position. If you are interested in uh, genetics and genomics of wild or dam, so please contact Maria if you are interested. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and bring on any questions I can answer. Great talk. Uh, how do you annotate 5,000 genes without going crazy? Uh, I didn't do it, but I know there's only a single person doing it, and he's been doing it for years. And he's still at it. There will be more additions soon, I think, to that database. Next okay. question by Ia. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk, and seems like a very, uh, I would say, promising future for this species. I was just wondering whether you 
looked on the chloroplast or the organelle genomic diversity of this uh, genus to the other uh, organ. I haven't looked at it in detail, but the sequences are there. Uh, I looked briefly at the chloroplast genome, uh, just as a size comparison, and it's the same as with barley, and also with mitochondrial genome, like in the size range, those are comparable to what is published with barley. But I haven't looked into the diversity at all at the moment. Or was that a question? Yeah, yeah okay. I know, nice presentation. Um, you mentioned it at some point in your talk that you identified more um, inversions and chromosomal rearrangements than we saw in the entire barley pan genome, the Hordium bulgari pan genome. Mm -hmm. Have you looked to see if any of these rearrangements would cause phenotypic differences, just as Martin did within the Hordium bulgari gene pool? Uh, not yet, not yet, no. Uh, but that would be next steps in the coming weeks. Quick answer, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about color in, uh, in barley. As you know, there is a wide variation on, on, on the trait due to the accumulation of different pigments in different tissues. And these pigments are um, important for nutritional values, but they are also important because may help uh, the, the seed to protect against uh, uh, biotic or abiotic stre stresses. And for this reason, uh, the psi and the genes that are controlling this, uh, this trait have been uh, longly studied, and some of them eventually have been cloned. So I'm going to talk about the black seed phenotype. Hopefully you can see clearly in the, in the, in the screen. Um, so the, the black seed is due to the accumulation of phytomelanins uh, by oxidation of simple phenolic um, compounds. And in this nice paper from a couple of years ago, uh, you can see that the, the accumulation of phytomelanin starts uh, at the early death stage uh, in chloroplast derived plastids that were called the melanoplasts. Um, the trait is controlled by a single dominant locus that is mapped on the long um, arm of chromosome 1H, and as Nils said, it's called the BLP1, that stands for Black Lemma and Pericarp 1. And nowadays it's mapped at a resolution uh, 0 0.8 megabases. So uh, our aim was to map uh, uh, the locus by uh, an association mapping approach uh, using the Wilby collection. Uh, this collection has shown before a very high resolution uh, due to its uh, wide uh, diversity. In fact, um, this collection is composed by uh, 450 accessions from worldwide origin. Half of them are Landresi sampled everywhere in the world, as you can see from this map. So we have um, accurately scored the, the, the phenotype. Uh, you can see from this picture that there is a gradient in the, in the phenotype. Also, there is some environmental effect. So we decided to simply score the presence or absence of the uh, black uh, phenotype. And then we used this uh, phenotype to, to map uh, uh, the locus uh, um, by using over 400,000 SNPs. Uh, that were der deriving from exon sequencing. And you can clearly see that there is a sharp peak at the very end of chromosome uh, 1H. So um, here I'm showing just a, a zoom of, on the 0.8 uh, megabases I was mentioning before. This is on Morex version 2. And um, you can appreciate probably that we have SNPs over almost all the genes in the region. And that to me, the most associated SNP is uh, within a gene coding for a purple acid phosphatase that was previously proposed as the best candidate for, uh, for the trait. Then we observed uh, a single recombination event with respect to the second uh, most associated SNP, and five recombination events with the, the, the SNP that is more on the, on the right. Um, so this um, uh, gene um, is called PAP27. Uh, it's a metal binding protein. Um, it's similar to three Arabidopsis proteins that are um, localized in the chloroplast. And um, in this condition, where the pH is quite high, uh, purple acid phosphate is the show peroxidase activity. So it's also in line with the, with the expected uh, uh, biochemical uh, function. Um, OK, uh, then we went uh, on the pan genome. In fact, uh, among the 20 accessions that were uh, sequenced, there are three black barleys. Uh, HOR 1381, HOR 21599, and HOR 10 And most important, this last one, HOR 10 is among the four uh, barleys that were sequenced and annotated at a high level. 
Um, and when we look at the BLP region, we were very happy to see that there was actually a, a duplication of uh, POP27 here in red, while the rest of the, the locus is quite conserved all uh, in, in this um, in this uh, barley session, but the application actually was only present in the black barley, I forgot to say. Um, and if we zoom here, um, again on PAP27, you can see that Morex has a single copy of the gene that we have called PAP27-1. Uh, well, on, on the bottom panel, you can see HORT1350. Uh, HORT1350 has two full-length copies of the gene. Uh, they are in the same scaffold, around 65 KB apart. And then we have a gene that we call PAP274 on the left uh, that uh, is uh, more similar to Morex and another one that we call PAP272 that is more differentiated. Um, on the top panel, you see HORT13 and HORT21. In this case, uh, the two genes are on different scaffolds. Uh, then we have, um, again, uh, on the right side, PAP272 uh, that is more differentiated with respect to Morex, and this is identical to the one found it found in, in, in HORT and 350. While on the left, we have just a, a partial duplication, a portion of PAT27, we have called PAT273, and this is almost identical to, to the MOREX gene. Uh, so this duplication obviously is quite interesting because this uh, gene that, that has differentiated obviously may have uh, evolved a new function, and this also would fit very well with the, with the dominant inheritance of, uh, of, the, of the locus. Uh, so we want, uh, first of all, to confirm uh, this, uh, this application and to see if uh, this is diffused and, and is present in all the black barley. So we went back to the uh, raw SNPs data in the Willby collection. So I'm showing here a SNP matrix where uh, you can find in the line uh, all and the rows, all the, the SNPs that are mapping within the SNP, the PAP27 gene. And then I have lighted, highlighted here in, in orange the heterozygous SNPs. And you can find that we have detected heterozygous SNPs only in black barley. Uh, so this may be due to the fact that actually um, black barley, we have two copies of the genes and they are differentiated. So by exon capture, we will capture both of them. But then we are going to map to a reference genome that is Morex that has a single copy of the gene. So these SNPs between the two parallels will be called as a false heterozygous position. Uh, so in this way, we were able to confirm a possible duplication. And also, you can clearly see that there are two different haplotypes, actually. So uh, on the left side, there is haplotype 1, where the um, heterozygous codes are present only in the 3' prime of the gene. While on haplotype 2, we have a heterozygous call on the whole, uh, on the full um, length of the gene. So this may resemble the, the, what we observed on the, on the genome, actually. So haplotype 1 will be the haplotype of uh, HOR13 and HOR21, where there is just a, a, a partial duplication. While haplotype 2 will be the, the haplotype of HOR10350, where we have two, co two full copies of the gene. And this was also confirmed by looking at the mean depth of coverage in these three haplotypes. So yellow here, you can see Morex. Then the black barley with the haplotype 2, you have a higher read count along the whole length of the gene. While in, in black barley from the haplotype 1, you have a higher read count only on the 3' prime of the gene. So this is... Uh, actually confirmed, so we can see that this is the um, situation of the gene. So Morex has a single gene that is PAP271. Then PAP272 is shared by all the black barley from both haplotypes. Then black barley with haplotype 1 have this uh, partial duplicated gene. And uh, uh, black barley with haplotype 2 have the full length gene that is PAP274. Uh, we have uh, uh, SNPs, as I said, and, and small index along this gene, and we have used it this uh, variant to, to uh, develop uh, uh, marker assay, genomic marker assay, such as the one that I'm showing here. So if I amplify um, barley with, with uh, black and yellow barley with these primers, here in red, you will see that in, in black barley we have uh, um, uh, a pool of, of um, different amplicon from different parallels, but then if I use this restriction enzyme, for example, here, I will easily isolate PAP272 with respect to the other uh, copies. So we have um, such marker assays uh, for all the four parallels, and we have used it to actually confirm what we have observed uh, on, the, on the exon capture data from, from Wilby. Okay, so the protein level, this is the, these are the domains in the, in the protein from Morex. Uh, then 
protein T73, if it translated, will result probably in a truncated protein. And what is interesting also in protein T74, we have observed a single base insertion um, in, in the exon 2 uh, disease from the genome, and we have confirmed by Sanger sequencing. So also protein T74 may be a truncated protein. So once again, our best candidate is the pilot number two. Um, we have eight amino acid substitution uh, with respect to, to the Monax version, and two of them have been called as deleterious by the software that calls uh, Provian. And we, we need to, to investigate further this, uh, this um, amino acid substitution. Um, then we look at, at the promoter, and it's important. So we observe that in the promoter of PAP27-2, there are um, um, regulatory elements for a response to ABA and also uh, binding site for MIB1 transcription factor that are well known to be involved in, in, in color in different plant species. So there may be also different um, regulation of the gene, and this is what we are uh, have tried to, to test uh, by using the same um, CAPS assays that I showed you before. Uh, in fact, it was up to now impossible to develop uh, um, paralog specific primer for quantitative PCR. So uh, we have taken Morex and Golden here, and then three black barley, HOR13, HOR21, and these uh, will be actually is a surrogate for HOR10350, so the same haplotype of HOR10350. Uh, uh, we have sampled um, seeds at the medium milk and the soft duff stage. Then, as I said, uh, we used the, the same primer that I showed you before. Um, amplifying a pool of pop and seven paradox, and you can see that in black barley you, you have a, an induction of, of this uh, pop 27 and if we apply the, the same uh, restriction enzyme digestion that I showed you before, you can clearly see that the gene that is actually induced is a pop 27 and uh, here I have also a second independent biological replicate. Uh, so we try to confirm this observation. Um, so we, we have taken the um, data from these uh, papers, so they run RNA-seq on different uh, Bauman isogenic line differing for, uh, for a BLP. Uh, we have taken the reads and we have mapped all the reads against uh, HOT 10350 so that we have the, the, the two parallax. And then here I'm reporting the ratio of the reads uh, uh, between uh, black and, bar and uh, yellow isogenic lines. And once again, you can see that the highest ratio, so the highest induction is, is uh, on, on, on uh, the PAT27-2 parallel. Um, okay, so um, I show that actually BLP1 is controlling the black seed in our will be collection. Um, that black barley share, all the black barley share a duplication of the candidate gene PAT27. We are also wondering if if over than duplication, also copy number variation may be involved. Uh, we have seen that the expression of the paralog number two, PAP272, is induced during the maturation of the spike. Now we are trying to validate it, obviously this model. And for example, we are uh, working together with uh, Ping Yang in China. Uh, they have a, a mutagenized population of a barley land race that, that is called Hatiaxi, that is fully black, you can see here. And among the mutants, they found um, some yellow plants, uh, or less black plants, I would call them. Um, so in this case, for example, they have taken this plant, and they have crossed it with the wild type, and they made a bug segregant analysis, and actually this mutation is mapping to BLP. Uh, so they are going to sequencing the, the, um, uh, the PAT27 paradox, and Ping just called me. Last week, he said that he, he got the sequence of the, of the um, exon, the coding sequence, and didn't find any mutation. So now he's, he's uh, sequencing the promoter region, and hopefully uh, we'll be more lucky. And um, we are also um, trying to understand why and how the black phenotype actually arose. So uh, most probably, uh, phytomelanin has a, a sort of protection of the embryo against a high light or a high UV. Uh, you can see, for example, from this picture that the, the accumulation starts uh, in coincidence with the embryo, uh, the seed. And also, 
Uh, many ballet sessions that are sampled in, in um, the highlight in Tibet or Ethiopia are, uh, are, um, are black, a black phenotype, so there may be uh, a reason. Um, and, and we are actually have shown um, uh, black barley in, in, in the field in Ferenzora, for example, with this simple shading system or in controlled condition with different light intensity. And what we observed is that actually the, the black color is uh, much less pronounced in these conditions. Um, and also we have data to understand how uh, these different haplotypes evolved uh, and how the, 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 the black phenotype originated. And I think that's all. So just let me thank all the, the people that were involved in the project and in particular uh, Davide Guerrad, who made most of the computational, computational work. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, did you already, uh, do you already have plans to, some, to do some transcending experiments like over expressing different alleles? So, sorry, oh, Okay. Do you have already plans to do transcending experiments like uh, over expressing the different alleles in a uh, golden points background? Or? Yeah, actually, we have to talk to Jochen because he said that he has some black barley that can regenerate, so we would like to knock out the mutant, the, the, the part 27 paralog in the black barley. We didn't try yet to, to overexpress, for example, the part 27 in golden. We have just cloned the gene and who knows, we will have a black and promise instead of golden promise. Thank you, Alessandro. Very interesting. Uh, so you have this application and then you get black seeds and then I understand you can do crosses so the sort of old part goes away and you still have black seed grains. It's not really a question about expression. So they're both the well both the old and the new gene can be expressed. And the protein is metal containing, so is it an enzyme that do these things you in, you have invented a new enzyme in this case? Or is this a regulatory uh, gene product? Uh, well, this enzyme uh, is a part of acid phosphate that is actually possibly oxidating these phenolic compounds into in, in, in the in the in the pericarp or in the lemma. Then we have observed this variation at the promoter level, so we think is is maybe something related to the expression over than the 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 protein. Um, then, um, I mean, wouldn't it be possible to get black seeds also with the original single gene you had there from the beginning, like in Morex? Yeah. Um, I think this is a question for yep. Jochen Kumlin. You need some yep. gene editing on the Morex copy. I think yep. That is exactly the experiment. But do you have to do a lot of modifications then to get that? Because you had a lot of modifications. Yeah, yep. that's true. Very interesting. You have to raise your hand more high. I can't see you, Ivan. So, Ivan first, then there. We take. Yeah, it's more of a comment. I, I think it's clear from your evidence that this is coming from the promoter. So, it should be as easy as taking the promoter from the land race and fusing it to a normal Morex gene and expressing it in the Golden Promise. That should yeah. give you a black phenotype. I mean, that's why in the coding sequence, I didn't find any mutation, but I asked it being, please sequence the, the promoter because I expect to have mutation over that probably. Thank you. Uh, Konstantin Jansen from Grammy Nord in Norway. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering, you probably had it, you said it in your opening statement, but what is uh, in for us humans? You said the UV protection for the barley, but what's in for the human for the black barley? Is there anything to catch or something to avoid? <laughs> Well, actually, the phytomelanin should not have any nutritional value. So it may have a, a protection for this, so a value for the seed, but not for human. At, at least, I mean, I read of some sunscreen protection made by phytomelanin, but I, I don't know if barley is the, the best uh, uh, plant where to extract phytomelanin to make sunscreen. Ali, let's talk. Um, I'm slightly puzzled by your GWAS results from the... Um, uh, will be collection because if I recall correctly, all heterozygotes would have been removed from your data set before you did the analysis. So, in other words, the, the SNPs you detect wouldn't have been heterozygous. Yeah, um, actually, we went back to the raw SNP data. So, we had a set of SNPs that are uh, for GIVAS where heterozygotes are removed, but then for allele mining, we go back to the 
raw data before filtering out the heterozygous. Uh, and, and after this is how we first uh, hypothesized the, the, the presence of a duplicated genes. Then we went on the back in the pan gene and we observed that was real actually. But yeah. so we have two different data sets in the will be one is just for Jivas where all the heterozygous are removed and then another one for a little mining that is more complete. So, so just to support two other comments have been made in the audience, I wouldn't be surprised if this story was a little bit more complicated than you made out. Yeah. Um, I think this is also for the coffee break. Then the last final quick question by Jörg Schondelmeier here in front. So you have a big exercise here this morning. The microphone. <laughs> Me too. Um, it came to my mind then you said that uh, the black barley is on elevated um, um, areas. Maybe it's a matter of very short vegetation time and that the black seeds le um, sitting on the ground are getting more um, warm by the sun because in Tibet and Ethiopia and highlands you have a uh, very short vegetation time and uh, so perhaps if you have a black seed it's getting warmer earlier and so it can um, yeah, elaborate yeah. on this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can also test different um, temperatures during, during uh, grain filling, if they may induce the, the, the black color. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, as Neil said, my today talk will be about gene expression uh, atlas during barley grain development. And uh, grain development is kind of hot topic for a long time. Many studies have been published also, uh, on basic uh, model organisms such as Arabidopsis and uh, a lot of papers were published also on maize. But uh, in Czech Republic we have, let's say, different criteria. And <laughs> no, seriously, but with the third, fourth place on, uh, in worldwide production is the barley, uh, very important crop model for Central Europe and not only. And uh, while there is no uh, detailed seed transcriptome published in barley, we decided to study molecular and cellular uh, mechanisms governing the seed development. And we performed uh, RNA-based based, uh, transcriptomic study of different seed tissues. And our main goal was to build a useful resource for basic uh, research scientists and also for cereal breeders. Uh, when we look on the seed development, uh, we can see it's a fast and dynamic process. And uh, uh, the most uh, interesting changes occurs in endosperm. Uh, and everything starts by double fertilization, and after that, uh, endosperm is present as a, as a syncytium. And at certain point, uh, it's divided by cell walls into single cells, each containing one nuclei. And after that, we can see endosperm is uh, differentiated. It starts accumulation of storage products and uh, matures. And at the end, it uh, desiccates, and almost whole endosperm, except aleuron layer, simply dies. And to cover the whole uh, seed development, uh, we dissected uh, three main seed tissues: uh, embryo, endosperm, and seed maternal tissues at uh, five different uh, time points along the seed development, ranging from four until 32 days uh, after pollination. And uh, when we first look on the data, we can see there are uh, tissue clusters like uh, embryo cluster. We can see also cluster of seed maternal tissue samples. But endosperm is divided into two separate clusters, uh, one including only four days syncytial endosperm, and the second uh, big cluster uh, including all endosperm, the rest of the endosperm samples. So it means that. Uh, since it's yeah, endosperm has probably such a different transcriptome that it's uh, not different only from the endosperm tissues, not only from the rest of the seed tissues, but also from the endosperm. And uh, we can see something similar also principal component analysis, uh, uh, where we have a uh, big distance between uh, 4, 8 and 16 days. So probably not only between during cellularization, but also during differentiation, there is a huge transcriptional reprogramming. 
And we go deeper and we look on the dynamic of expression in each seed tissue and uh, we can notice that there is a significantly lower median value uh, of the endosperm expression uh, compared to embryo and seed maternal tissues and uh, it's probably due to high number of low expressed genes. We can see it on a Venn diagram uh, where we have a fraction of genes with expression ranging from 0 to 1 TPN. And here we see that there is almost 70% of those genes expressed in endosperm and almost 25% uh, of them are endosperm specific. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have uh, genes with a huge expression, uh, much, much uh, higher than compared to seed maternal tissues and also embryo. And again, on Venn diagram, we can see that uh, in a fraction of genes with expression of uh, higher than one TPM, uh, almost 80% of those genes are uh, expressed in endosperm and almost 50% of them are endosperm specific. And uh, those genes are uh, involved in uh, categories uh, for uh, like translation, negative regulation of uh, peptidase activity, macromolecular biosynthetic process and, and so on. And uh, because our transcriptomic data are uh, uh, really complex, uh, now I would like to focus only on endosperm. And uh, first of all, we did a differential expression analysis and we analyzed differential, differential expression between every possible combination of our selected developmental time points. And first, we go uh, on the developmental axis. Uh, so, like genes upregulated at 8 compared to 4, upregulated at 16 compared to 8. And we perform functional analysis, and uh, uh, we can see many terms uh, enriched between 4 and 8 days uh, in upregulated genes, uh, including DNA methylation, energy reserve metabolic process, microtubule organization, and also many downregulated and many of, many of them are endosperm specific so those terms are not enriched in any other seed tissues uh, next uh, we performed clustering analysis and for this we took uh, all differentially expressed genes it was almost 23000 unique genes and uh, out of this uh, we get those 13 clusters and we were particularly interested in uh, clusters with uh, stage-specific expression. So, uh, four-day specific, eight-day specific, 16-day. And uh, when we look inside those clusters on the genes, we can see there are many already known marker genes uh, from other organisms. Uh, for example, AO9 is present in three clusters in different homologs. Uh, this is a gene uh, known from maize, it's marker for aluron layer. Uh, also ESR6 is from maize, it's for embryo surrounding region. And uh, as you see, we have, uh, we have many other markers in different clusters. And to investigate possible relations and functions between those genes, uh, we performed uh, one more clustering analysis, it's called weighted gene co-expression network analysis. And this analysis uh, uh, investigates uh, modules of highly correlated genes, uh, summarize them, and uh, relate them to each other. And uh, output of this analysis is this kind of uh, uh, gene expression network, where we have uh, different modules uh, by colors, and uh, we see expression profile, the number of genes, and we, we can notice that there is a kind of developmental axis uh, going from early uh, clusters uh, through middle, middle up, up to late clusters. And on the top of this analysis, we performed uh, uh, gene ontology enrichment and promoter of motif enrichment analysis. And we get uh, biological processes uh, which are enriched in different uh, modules. Uh, we can uh, see there are some modules for uh, probably for cellularization, like a Turkish module. And, uh, and we see also uh, promoters, like uh, motifs in the promoters of those genes, uh, which are enriched in those modules. And uh, also here we can see uh, many known uh, promoters, uh, important promoters like OPAC endosperm 2 from the maize, which is uh, important endosperm regulator development in maize. And uh, 
to make make our data uh, more accessible, we established a cooperation with Nicholas J. Provar from University of Toronto in Canada, and he's author of the bio bioanalytic resource for plant biology. And uh, this tool allows to view expression as uh, for electronic pictographs or heat maps. It's available at ePlantBali at bar.utoronto.ca. And our data are so far unpublished, but uh, will be published soon. And to demonstrate uh, uh, some kind candidate for endosperm specific marker genes, which can be used for basic and applied research of grain development and uh, also potentially for study post psychogotic hybridization barrier. We took uh, results of all our analysis which we performed and we set up the criteria for some marker and we said like, okay, let's take a gene which is differentially expressed, uh, which is presented some kind of module like uh, middle late expression module. Uh, we would like to have some transcription factor as a nice regulator of development and uh, it should have some functionally characterized homolog in other species. And we decided to evaluate this marker by RNA in situ and in the future also by Tilling mutant. And for RNA in situ, we established cooperation with Professor Rudiger Simon from uh, C plus in Düsseldorf in Germany. And they are doing uh, RNA in situ on Bali tissues routinely. So we uh, we uh, did RNA in situ on uh, using NFYB transcription factor probe. This is a gene from RISE, uh, which is specific for aleuron layer, and it's also involved in the, in the regulation of grain feeding and endosperm development. And from the from the first two pictures, we can see that there are already some marks of expression at four days, uh, even before cellularization. And at uh, 16 days, we have uh, expression pattern all around the seed in the first two to three layers of the endosperm uh, directly under the seed maternal tissues. And uh, another marker which we selected is uh, Della protein GAI. This gene in, in Arabidopsis restrains cell proliferation and expansion. So it could be a good marker for sensitivity of endosperm. Uh, it is preserved the cellularization. And it also contributes to seed dormancy and regulates the germination in Arabidopsis. And from RNA in situ results, we see a really strong expression pattern uh, during uh, sensitial endosperm stage. And uh, also, also some, uh, some, uh, um, some pattern of expression at 16 days on the periphery under, under the aleuron layer. And to summarize uh, our work, so I would like to say we provide a comprehensive special temporal information about barley grain development and uh, we reveal the major biological processes ongoing in different tissues at different stages. And uh, we provided uh, genes and transcription factors uh, with a possible impact on uh, the regulation of endosperm development. And with this, I would like to thank my supervisor, Aleš Pečinka, which, is, uh, which helped us really, like, his support was really amazing during my PhD studies. Also to our collaborators, uh, Rudiger, Miriam, and Nicolas, and my colleagues, uh, Jana and Anna, and also to Isaiah for the help with the RNA in situ, and uh, also to our uh, to our uh, supporters and our institutions, and, and also thanks to your attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for this clear, interesting presentation, and apologies. Uh, you're, of course, not from Poland, but you're from the famous in Institute of Experimental Botany in Olomouc, Czech Republic. Martin, I was wondering, is the endosperm development in all three lobes of the endosperm similar? Excuse me, I, I did not... The endosperm is consi consists of three lobes, two laterals and a central. Is gene expression the same in all three? Uh, probably no. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we took a whole endosperm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For this, we would like to, in the future, maybe make the laser capture and micro dissection where we can distinguish those, those different endosperm parts. Yeah. There's another question in there. So we have a, a, a new question cluster here at the right corner now.
Sorry about that. Thank you, Martin, for the presentation. If I understood well, correct me if I didn't, but if I understood well, this was done with a single environmental condition for the analysis. To what degree you think the environmental conditions for in which seeds are growing may affect the transcriptome, the transcriptome and the consequent uh, genes that are related to expression in the different conditions? Yes, yes. Uh, it was done uh, in uh, like optimal growing condition for barley morex cultivar. And as you said, it can affect uh, the temperature. Mainly the temperature can affect uh, and the, the whole seed uh, development simply by the higher temperature, the endosperm, or I said endosperm, but <laughs> I mean the like, seed, seed development is much faster. And with the lower expression, uh, uh, with the lower temperature, we have the slower development. And with the higher temperature, we have also Probably we can expect some stress-related genes and and so on, but yeah. Any other? Ah, just, just follow up. following up a second. Uh, that is that would say that if temperatures are higher, you need to change the time frequency or the it, the translation of your timing may be different. But the question is whether the actual transcription will be different at the same phenological stage of the seed regardless of the temperature effect of accelerating development, by effects of temperature, by stressing the seeds or under drought conditions or whatever. Yes, yes, it can be. And uh, this is why we study the marker genes, like the really strong candidates for the, for the marker genes, which should not be affected by, by developmental conditions, we hope. 